The following interview was conducted with Howard Taylor, Director of the Division of Recreational Sports uh, for the Purdue Library Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, March the 18th, 2013 in the Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emeritus of Library Science. Good afternoon. Good Howard afternoon. Taylor. Thank you very much. Let's start out. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and early years. Sure. Um, I was born in 1954 uh, in Chevrolet, Maryland. And uh, my, both of my parents were from, from Maryland. And uh, my mom was uh, a homemaker, stayed in the home and took care of myself and my two brothers. Okay. And my dad uh, had a flooring company. And he uh, did wood floors, tile floors, kind of a family business. And actually, both of my brothers are in that family business today. So it's still going on? Uh, in a different form, but uh, sure. doing the same thing, doing floors in the Washington, D.C. area. Good. Tell us a little about grade school. Um, um, again, went to uh, Agar Road Elementary School and had a great time there. Uh, it was interesting, I always hear about people going to kindergarten. Where I went to school, there was no kindergarten, so we started in the first grade. Was there a place, that, if you wanted to go to kindergarten, close by or not? You know, I never knew. I didn't know there was, at, at that time, I just thought you started first <laughs> we grade. Started and, first grade, right? And then I found out that other kids went to kindergarten, <laughs> but we didn't have that there. So okay. uh, it was a great school and... and uh, were there sixth grades or eighth grades? There was sixth grades. Okay. And uh, then after uh, elementary school, my family moved from Prince George's County to Montgomery County. And I started uh, there at White Oak Junior High School, which was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Okay. And uh, again, had a great time there. I was involved in sports. I did track and cross country. And well, tell and us a little about high school and the course and some of the yeah. athletics and the organization students. Yeah, I um, was went to Springbrook High School in Silver Spring, Maryland, and uh, was involved in you know a lot of activities. But primarily, I was uh, ran cross country and track, and uh, competed all three years. Was a varsity letter winner all three years there, and. In fact, in my senior year, I was on the Maryland State uh, Mile Relay Champions. We won the championship, and our team won the state championship that year Wonderful. in high school. So it was a, a great experience. Good. Uh, but but was just involved in in Lot you know of lots of activities when I was at school. Right. Um, what was it? Any special uh, programs? Were you in pre college or college prep or just a general one? Did they have? Just general. I don't, okay. I don't, again, back then I don't know that there was anything that Maybe that kind of talked right. that way. It was general, um, but uh, you know the intention was that I was always planning to go to to college okay. uh, after I was done with with high school. Tell us a little about college, where you went, and uh, what campus life and professors, et cetera. Yeah. Did you continue on with your athletics, too? Well, that's a great question. Um, when I got done with high school, I um, was really looking around the East Coast for schools and, and ended up getting an opportunity to find out about Colorado State uh, in Fort Collins, Colorado, and at the last minute made a decision to go there and uh, started out running cross country uh, as a walk-on there. Uh, but distance running wasn't always my, my forte and after about three months of that decided that we were averaging 15 to 20 miles a day. Uh, I decided That's I was going lot. to focus on my schoolwork. I wasn't on scholarship and so I uh, dropped out of that and then got involved in intramurals. I got my degree in, in physical education and so at that time, that was, you know, today that's either health and kinesiology or exercise right. science. Uh, but at that point, it was called physical education. And I uh, was planning to be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. I wanted to coach cross country and track. But I was involved in intramurals. I ran track intramurals and, and did, you know, all the different sports I could do in intramurals. And I also coached. Um, I was coaching a lot of particularly women's teams, and I had uh, teams in every sport that I coached in the intramural program. And Super. Was the physical education your major, was it both male and female? It was. Okay. Uh, but interestingly, it had just switched over at that point, so that was in the um, mid-70s. Mm -hmm. uh, they still had a women's gymnasium at that time, uh, although they had recently started having men and women in the same program. Uh, but there was still some separation 
at that point at sure. Colorado State. Right. Uh, but uh, got a chance to, to do classes with both men and women, although there were some things that we did right, separately. Right, exactly, okay. And then what uh, what came after that? After you, did you go on to grad school then? And yeah, after I got done with that, I did my student teaching. Uh, I student taught at Bear Creek High School in Denver and enjoyed that, but I had always envisioned being an elementary physical education teacher. Uh, ended up getting an internship that was tied to a graduate program and I interned in Denver for a semester. And when I completed that, I went back to Colorado State as part of the graduate program and began working on my degree then. At that time, the graduate program was a one-year program. And so after my first year, I hadn't gotten enough credits to get my degree and I was able to get the intramural department to give me a graduate assistantship for the second year. Good. And so that really was my first time working uh, in intramural sports and I loved it and decided that's what I wanted to do with my career. And so that kind of was my start doing intramurals. I got to run the intramural basketball programs, flag football, uh, also helped supervise and train the people that were supervising the recreation center there on campus. Yeah, well, that sounds good. Then, uh, were, were, did you serve in the military at any time? Ever... I did not. Oh, okay. Uh, a little bit your career path before you came to Purdue. Tell sure. us about that. Um, well, after I got my degree, my graduate degree at Colorado State, um, I didn't find a recreational sports job right away, and I got a teaching job in Denver. And I started teaching elementary physical education at uh, Poulton Elementary School and um, did that for a semester but in November of that year I got contacted by uh, Larry Prio who was the director of recreational sports at Marquette University and he had met me at a national conference and asked if I would apply for their intramural job at Marquette University and so I applied for the job went out in December and I interviewed and they offered me the job and so you know, it was, a, it was a tough call. I was already in a full-time job, but I thought if I wanted to get into university recreation, I needed to make that jump right then. So I left my position uh, in Denver and uh, moved to Milwaukee in January of that year and started as the assistant director for intramurals and for the Health Fair Recreation Center. And so I got to work my first job at Marquette. Was it a large program, you know, a large facility and a program that they had there? Or? It was a really nice facility. It was uh, specifically built for recreation. And, uh, you know, Marquette was a smaller That's private right. uh, Jesuit right. campus. And so it gave me a great start. But the exciting thing is I got to work with Larry Prio, who, you know, we is met was later a, on. Yes, that, that uh, Larry, you know, has his Purdue connections but he gave me a great opportunity. He was a great first boss for me to have, taught me a lot. Um, and being at a smaller school, I got a chance to do a lot of different things right. uh, because you were called on to do so many more things at a smaller school. So it was a great start. And after about four years there, I looked for a new position. Uh, I'd been doing intramurals and sport clubs at Marquette and I got a chance to become the assistant director for facility operations at Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, and interestingly, my wife is from Wichita. It just so happened the job opened there. I applied, I got the job, and so after four years at Marquette, I left and went to uh, Wichita State University and uh, worked as the facility operations assistant director for uh, about three and a half, four years, and then in their recreation. In their area? recreation, okay. it was a brand, and and the exciting thing there was we opened a brand new recreation center. So I got there about nine months before the recreation center opened. So I had an opportunity to help build the program um, from scratch, open the new building, and get things started there. Uh, after about four years, the director left and took a job uh, in Minnesota and they asked me to step in as the interim director for a year and then after I served a year in that capacity they um, offered me the job full-time and so I ended up spending a total of 18 years at Wichita State wow. uh, and then I was approached by Arizona State University to apply for their director's job 
and I ended up applying and I got that job and I was the director of recreational sports at Arizona State for four years and then uh, in 2005 I had the opportunity to come here and I've now been here for eight years uh, at Purdue. Uh, very nice. Let me ask, um, what was it uh, between Arizona and Wichita? Was Arizona about the same size program or? No, very oh, different. Okay, um, make a comment on Yeah, that. no, it was. Um, That's it, a long time at Wichita. It was a long time at Wichita State and honestly, I thought that I would spend sure. my entire career there. I had no plans to, to really oh, go yeah. anywhere. Um, Wichita State was a, is a commuter campus. Okay. And so a very, very different type of a campus than Purdue. No residents at all? Or? Very, very limited. Okay. Probably about 1,000 students lived in the residence halls. Uh, the average age was between 30 and 31 years old. So wow. a very, very different type of a campus than, oh, yeah. than Purdue. And so it had an impact on programs and services. I mean, for example, many afternoons, the campus was very quiet because students were either had jobs. Right. Uh, I can't remember the percentage, but there's a huge percentage of our students there that owned homes. I mean, it, it was a just a totally different type sure. of campus. But, uh, but they're getting an undergraduate degree though, are they they're, not? They're getting an undergraduate degree. Okay. And so it was a great place to work, uh, small regional campus. We had about 14,000 students. That's and, a nice size. And a, and a great place to work and a great place to, to raise uh, my family. Um, but the opportunity came to go to Arizona State and Arizona State at the time was about 55,000 students and so a much bigger campus. But surprisingly, Arizona State is also considered a commuter campus. Uh, many of the students at that point lived off campus and, and for a school of about 55,000, they only had about 5,000 who lived in residence halls. That's interesting. Now that's been changing. They, since I've left there, they have been adding residence halls and they are really growing their residential population on campus. But mm -hmm. uh, brand new facility, um, beautiful campus, a great place to live. Nice and warm. Nice and warm. Uh, <laughs> it was really a wonderful place to sure. live and, and work and I have great memories and, and experiences of working at Arizona State. How did the uh, uh, contact come to come to Purdue? Was it the job listed or did? Yeah, there was a job listing and, and you know at the time I just kind of saw it and I knew the history and and tradition of Purdue and I just threw my my name in the hat just to kind of see and um, I got the chance to come interview in I believe it was early October of um, 2004 and came out and interviewed and it was about a three-day process I mean it was a really long uh, process I met with lots of students and faculty staff um, I have to admit that when I saw the co-rec it was certainly a stark difference between where I was coming from. The building I was in was, you know, pretty much a new recreation center, and what I was seeing here was a building that was primarily built in 1957. Right. Yeah. And I think the thing that stood out to me was um, how vibrant and exciting the student population was. Uh, it was really my first time getting a chance to work on a residential. Uh, type of a campus, sure. a tra more Compa traditional compared type to the of other campus. Two, yeah. yeah, compared to the other schools I've worked at, and it seemed like the Corec um, was in need of some improvement, and it also seemed like the students and faculty staff were saying they wanted to see something improved, and so I left kind of with the idea that there was going to be some potential here to make a difference. Right. And and I know I was taking a step of faith because there was nothing that was said that sure. we're gonna do anything. But I just felt like the time was right to... And it uh, seemed like a do, need as And it well. seemed like a need to, to do something. You're right, well, now you're on board. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit of background on it. And you said it was built in, the original building, 1957, cost 2.5 mil. Then there were some add-ons in the 1980s. So tell us a little about that, the yeah. background. Well, you know, an exciting thing about the original, um, as they used to call it, the recreational gym, which then became known as the Corec, yeah. uh, was that it was the very first standalone recreation center that was built. And on any college? On any college campus. And it also 
amazingly, because at that time this didn't happen, it was a co-ed facility where men and women were able to use the same facility. At that time, across the rest of the United States, there were separate facilities for men and women. And it really wasn't until maybe the, the mid to late 60s and early 70s that you started seeing other co -ed facilities, facilities going with the co -ed. So Purdue was way ahead of their times in doing what they did sure. with the original co -rec. Um, and then uh, in 1981, there was an addition that was made where they added um, six basketball courts and 16 uh, racquetball courts uh, to to the facility because even though the the facility uh, it was still a, a pretty recent facility, the student population was growing so much that it had outgrown the size of the, sure. the facility. Uh, and then in 2000, the Boilermaker Aquatic Center opened. The university shut down all of the other smaller pools on campus and consolidated aquatics and swimming activities into the Boilermaker Aquatic Center. Where, now there was a pool in the Corec. Was there that was closed a pool at that in, time? Yes, the oh, pool in the Corec And there was one closed. in Lambert, was there not? There was one in Lambert as well. And then I believe there was, and this might have been even before that time, there was one, I think it's, I think it was Haas. I think. Years ago, that Years used to be, ago. that was used to call the Memorial Gymnasium. It was the Memorial Gym, right, That's exactly. Right. And back. so what happened is those pools closed and all of the swimming uh, activities were brought under one roof in the Boilermaker Aquatic Center. And, and that's a world-class facility. I mean, it is a spectacular space for the swim teams, but also a great space for recreational swimming as well. Uh, in 2001, uh, there was a renovation made to the basement of the Corec. It had been kind of a dirt floor area, and there were hmm. some squash courts and uh, you know some fitness spaces and small rooms, and that got renovated into the Colby Fitness Center, and okay. that was named after Ken and Linda Colby. Uh, they were um, looking to give a gift to the university, and they said they wanted to give something that was fun. And the idea came up about this, and they, they had actually known each other from the Corec and said, Perfect fit. What a perfect fit to, uh, to give money for that renovation. Right. And so it allowed us to improve the basement area of the Corec facility uh, at that time. Okay, now we're moving on. The movement is now underway to mm -hmm. move the facility yes. forward. Yes, well, again, um, After you came. Yes. Right. When, when I got here, uh, the first thing I did was, um, and I told folks when I interviewed, is that it was impossible for me to answer them about what was I going to do to fix the facility because it felt presumptuous to mm -hmm. say something if I hadn't already been here at least. So uh, once I got here, I decided that we needed to do um, an investigation to do a, uh, a study to find out what you know, where was the facility working, where was it not working, and then what should we do, and then to make sure we asked students what the needs were. Mm -hmm. And so we hired a consulting firm of Brailsford and Dunleavy, who's out of Washington, D.C. They came in uh, and uh, did an analysis. We did focus groups with, I think we did like 20-some different focus groups with students and faculty, staff, and we also did a survey that went out to uh, over 5,000 students that were selected on a random basis to try and figure out what was working, what wasn't working, where were the needs, kind of how did students use the existing facilities, and that was done in, um, it was completed in late 2006, early 2007, and we got a document that we were able to then share with students on campus, with the administration about what was the the need. What do they want? And, and, right. and what did students want? And uh, from there, we eventually started sharing more with students. And each year, I was working with the uh, Student uh, Government Association, right. the presidents and vice presidents. And what we did is we started sharing the information. We started sharing what other schools had done who had uh, put in newer facilities. And then I started taking students on road trips. Uh, the first group I took, we did a, a Saturday trip to University of Illinois. They had just opened a small facility and were 
renovating their large facility. So I thought a great chance to show them a smaller satellite building and then let them see kind of what a renovation project looked like. And those students came back enthused and began talking about it and sharing it with other students. Um, and things started happening after that. I know they were talking uh, with different folks, but we still were kind of not really moving in any direction, but just raising awareness. Generating more ideas, right. I, I started going out and giving presentations about the report across campus and to others to share with them what we found out about the needs. Uh, and then the really big trip that I think made the difference was in 2007 in December, I took a group of students uh, to Texas and we toured uh, Texas A&M, uh, University of Texas at Austin, Texas State, University of Texas San Antonio, and University of Houston and in a weekend. So we left on a Friday morning and got back on a Sunday night. Wow. And the, those campuses had all had newer facilities, but they had different types of facilities that had been, been built. And those students really got a chance to see in person what we were talking about in this report. And, and from a, and different for each of them. From e each of them from different so, perspectives and they saw the things that they liked and the things that they didn't like. And so those students came back and they were the group of student leaders that um, went to President Cordova and began saying they wanted something done. And so from there, a variety happen. of things happens. Eat for a number of years. Student government uh, did a um, passed a resolution saying that they wanted the correct to be fixed, and it passed a number of times unanimously, and that they understood that there would be some fees that would change because of that. And uh, the process progressed along the way until we were given authority to hire an architect, begin the design process, and then. Each step along the way, we had to go to the Commission for Higher Education, the State Budget Committee, and every step along the way, the students took the lead. They were the ones that were presenting this to the key, uh, key players. administrators and key players, and, and they're the ones that carried the story forward. Uh, we were there to help, right. help gather information, but they really carried the story, and and got this approved. Isn't one of the big things, though, that you might want to kind of, is the, the, the student fee, the fee. Yes. Um, you know, in order, obviously, to build a building of the magnitude that we've done, um, it was a fairly expensive proposition. It was a $98 million project. Once we, once we took all the data from the study, uh, we came up with what was needed, and then that was translated into square footage. You know, okay, if it, you build a gym, it's gonna cost this much and so forth. And so we end up with an estimate that it was gonna be somewhere in the $90 million range to do that. And um, we were able to then look at what would this cost from a student fee standpoint. And, and the reality is, is that the state doesn't fund okay. facilities like this. It's, you, they're, they're not gonna give money for it. So the, and this is typical across the country. Yeah. Recreation centers, are typically built through student fees on almost every they're campus. They're self-supporting. Yeah, they're self-supporting right. that way. And so we were able to come up with a dollar amount that would be charged to the students to help pay for this building and pay for the bonds uh, that would be 25-year bonds to do this. And uh, we came up with an amount, and that was shared with the students. It was shared with President Cordova, and we hit on the number that said this is a, an appropriate fee uh, and then we came up with a plan that said uh, we would phase that fee in over three years. So uh, over the course of three years, the fee went up. And because we were doing a phased renovation, each year the fee went up, we had already completed some portion of the project. And so in the case of the first year, we had built the T-REC facility to serve as a satellite operation uh, while we were under construction. And that opened in January, and the first fee took effect the following August. And then we uh, began uh, opening the new COREC uh, early this past fall yeah. when the second portion of the fee uh, hit, and uh, that um, allowed us to operate. We're operating now basically collecting only two-thirds of what the full sure. fee needs to be. And next fall, 
the final amount will hit. And it's about, uh, we're still waiting for, because the state does a biennial budget, we haven't right. actually been approved yet, but if everything goes according to the plan we had, it should be about $121.50 a semester um, to pay for the building. And the bulk of that goes to pay the debt service on the construction. Sure, phase. right. Let me ask you, was there any discussion at all about b demolishing and rebuilding, or was the, the, the feeling to, to add on? Or That's a great money. question. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, I had forgotten to mention this. Once we hired the architect, we had seven students that sat in with the architect to, to do the planning. And uh, we did all of that with their input. And so there was a great discussion about do we do one facility, do we do two facilities, do we do a satellite, do we do it in the same location. And after a lot of debate and analysis, uh, the decision was made is that the location we were at currently was really the best location because it's right next to the residence halls. Okay. It's, it's very accessible to folks. Um, so that was a decision made. That's a great location. Uh, discussion about doing a satellite, it was decided that, that we would be in a better spot to do one facility and make it a grand facility to really have that wow effect as opposed to diluting it and doing multiple facilities. And as we looked at whether we should tear down the entire thing and start all over or renovate, uh, we did some analysis on the cost. And in this particular case, we were able to get more, more building for our money by doing the renovation. In some cases, you do that analysis and you're better off starting sure. from scratch. But in our case, uh, it was about a 10 to 15 million differential. And we would have lost square footage if we would have tried to completely build brand new. Yeah, good point, okay. Um, and now, then the trustees, of course, approved it. Um, some features that, facilities that are sort of unique is that wellness center, some of the n new ones, that, uh, uh -huh. fa facilities that you have in the, that you didn't have before, are there any sure. you'd like to comment yeah, on? Yeah, some of the, you know, some of the new things that we've added is, is one of the things we tried to do is, is, um, make the facility um, be able to uh, have a long-term effect, that it would be able to adjust and change as time went on. And, and we wanted to have um, a space that could do more than just the traditional basketball and volleyball. So our thinking was always looking at those kinds of things as to how we did the design. And um, some of the things we added, the students wanted two wow factors. And with our building, we have an east entrance and a west entrance. And the students said they wanted to kind of grab people's attention no matter which side of the building they came in on. So on the east side, uh, it was decided that we would do a climbing wall, uh, which would provide an activity we've never been able to have before, but people had been asking about for years. And on the west entrance, we wanted to have this recreation pool, which was um, different than the Boilermaker Aquatic Center, which is a great pool for lap swimming and sure. competition. But they wanted something where you could recreate, uh, play water basketball, water volleyball, you know, fun features that you don't, you can't do in our other pool. So they thought that was the wow factors anchoring either end of the building. And then we added a MAC, which is a multi-activity court, which is a large court for inline hockey and soccer. We added a lot more fitness. The number one thing in the study that we did that students said they wanted, they wanted more cardio and strength, and they wanted a better track. And so uh, as we started designing the building, we went down the priority list from that study and said, we have to take care of the fitness needs first since that's the number one thing students and faculty staff said they wanted. Uh, we put in a nice track. The other thing students said they wanted windows. And anybody that's been in the old Corec, there weren't a lot of windows in the old Corec. We have added windows both inside and outside the facility. And I think we've achieved what we were trying to do is people say the feeling is so right. nice. They well, just, the atrium is, is awesome. The atrium is awesome. So welcoming. Yeah, it, it's welcoming. We hear, we hear exactly that from everybody that comes in. Um, and, and that was part of the goal. We wanted to make sure 
um, students were saying, you know, there's not a lot of really good gathering places on campus. So we tried to add some features where there's lounges and spaces where students can meet and hang out, whether it's before they work out or afterwards or even during the times they're working out. So we tried to add those features um, to the facility as well. We added more multi-purpose rooms. Uh, one of the things we heard from students was their groups. There's over 900 student organizations on campus. And they were going, we have to have places where we can meet and do things. And particularly those that are trying to do recreational types of activities. So we added those spaces and we were better able to serve students with that. One of the surprises of the project was the T-Rec building, which we opened as a temporary space to meet the fitness needs during construction. But the idea we had is if we build that space, why don't we build it with a different purpose when the project's done? And so we designed it to do the temporary fitness needs, but we made sure it could handle uh, an indoor turf situation for now. And so just a few weeks ago, we opened that facility up as an indoor turf facility and the students are playing indoor soccer, flag football, lacrosse, rugby. So all of those students that want to do those things have a place where they can play indoors. And as an example, this past spring break on Monday night, we had over 90 students in there at night on spring break playing soccer. <laughs> uh, it, it's worked out beautifully to meet the, the need of those students wanting to do those and activities. And what they wanted. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, well, then you got a pretty good, um, a lot of the staff or students that man that help out work there too. Yeah, I mean, with the expansion of the size of the facility, we mm -hmm. are somewhat a self-contained unit. So we provide all of our own custodial workers, our own maintenance workers, and staff to run programs. So uh, we almost doubled our staff. Because we increased the square footage by almost 160,000, actually more than that, 170,000 square feet, we needed to add custodians and maintenance workers to take care of that space. We almost tripled the amount of exercise equipment and we maintain all of that ourselves. So we added some staff to maintain that equipment. And then uh, with the size of the facility, we've added some new programs, things like uh, family and children's programs. Uh, during the time we were planning the building, there was a lot of discussion about the need for, uh, particularly with faculty and staff, wanting to have more activities that their families could do. So sure. we added a position to start doing those kind of programs. We had a person, we added a person to handle the climbing wall. Uh, we needed somebody that knew, you know, how do you run a climbing wall? <laughs> and so things like that. So the staff has grown, and because the buildings run most of the time by students, we now have somewhere around 500 student workers who work in all aspects of the building. Yeah, that's good. Um, now, the ranking in the Big Ten Recreational Centers, where would Purdue fall in pretty high well, up there? Well, there's not a, you know, there's not an official ranking no. uh, but it's the, system. It's, but is it the newest as, one, though? It, it's, it's the newest. Okay. Iowa opened one a couple years before us. Um, it's the most recent, you know, at this time. But uh, we've already had three Big Ten schools come and visit because they're trying to improve their facilities. <laughs> That's good. That tells uh, it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, from a size standpoint, based on the data I have, as a single recreation facility, uh, I think it's the largest. Uh, there are other campuses like Ohio State and Iowa who, if they take the square footage of all of their buildings, you know, they may have four or five different buildings. Right. They have more recreation space. But ours is a standalone. Standalone by itself. Uh, it's the biggest uh, specifically for recreation. Right. Um, you have an advisory board too? I do. Okay. Uh, we've got representation from students and, and faculty, staff, and we meet once a month. And uh, the general idea is to make sure we're sharing what we're doing with them, that they are gathering information from their constituents and bringing it to the meeting and using that as a great sounding board for things. So uh, they were included in the discussions about the building along the way, but they are an ongoing group that, you know, if they hear concerns about policies or issues coming up, they can bring right, it to the yeah. board meeting and we can discuss it and, right. and try and solve those issues as we go. Right, now the nice thing is the naming of it. 
The naming of the, the naming of the facility. Right. Um, you know, it was uh, decided that the and there's a lot of discussion. What should this be called? And when it was in the early project stage, it was the Purdue Student Fitness and Wellness Center, which is a mouthful. I was like, well, how's that? How's that going to work? Uh, but um, last year we found out that the facility was going to be named uh, for outgoing uh, President France Cordova. And um, you know, people have asked me about that, and, and honestly, I guess my view on it is that you know she played a key role. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people that played an important role. Our students played a, a role, but we needed to have an administration that was positioned sure. to work with the students and say, yes, this is something important for campus. And so, you know, her willingness to listen to them and to allow this project to go forward was really critical. Right, and she. You know, during the course of the project, I probably had the opportunity to meet with her three or four times, and she was involved in looking at the design, asking questions about it, and she wanted this to be a great facility for the students, and she took steps to make sure that this was uh, that facility that the students envisioned. And, and I know she brought this up a number of times. She said, you know, those students that came and talked to her wanted these things, and she was going to make sure <laughs> that, that, good. that those were included. So uh, she played a great, and it actually works out great because you know, with her last name being Cordova and the right. old name of the co-rec, you know, it just it just it, all it just naturally flowed together with the COR and the co-rec, and and so we've just stayed with it. it's still the co-rec. Uh, the official name on the front is the France A Cordova Recreational Sports uh, Center. But it works out great for everybody. And she probably had a lot of wow when she came to see it. Because she, she had not seen the finished thing, had she? She, she had. Came? I took her through the construction site uh, one time, and she was pretty amazed then. And it was a mess at that time because oh, it's sure. a construction site. But when she came back for the grand opening, um, she and Chris were just overwhelmed with um, how it's turned out. And I think it's a facility that that is going to serve the campus sure. for many, many years to right. come. And we know that most students on campus use the facility. So yeah, that's nice. we think it turned out great. Um, let's talk a little about um, family. Uh -huh. OK. Um, where did you meet your wife? Uh, in, in college? Or mm -hmm. you have children? We do. Um, uh, I met my wife uh, at Colorado State in my second year of graduate school. and. Um, we uh, dated for a while. I took the job at Marquette University, and and then in uh, '79 we got married, and uh, then we call it the decade of our children because our first son was born in '81, our daughter in '85, and our youngest in '89. So the '80s, <laughs> the, were, 80s is... the '80s was a big decade for us, uh, and uh, you know all of our kids are now grown. In fact, um, all three of them are now married. So they were born eight years apart, but they were married 18 months apart. So we had three marriages in 18 months. Uh, but they're all doing great. The, our son is an engineer. He got his degree at K-State, and uh, he is working in Colorado Springs right now. And our middle daughter got her degree at Arizona State. Uh, you can see a pattern here. It, each state where I worked, we dropped off one. <laughs> she got it at Arizona just State. Just worked out. It just worked out. And uh, she works uh, in Peoria, Illinois now. Um, she sells textbooks for Pearsons. And our youngest daughter um, is living in the Washington, D.C. area. She got her degree from Purdue. And uh, she works in uh, family, uh, child and family services. And, and actually just got offered a job and took it today. And Good. is going to start doing that in the D.C. area. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, any honors and honor or awards that you'd like to mention, and also then professional associations. And you were you've been the National Intramural Recreational Sports Association. Yeah, I've you know I've been involved in the National Intramural Recreational Sports Association sure. since '78. It's the primary association for university recreational sports professionals. Um, you know I've done a lot of things with them. I was the advertising manager for the their journal for a number of years. Sure. Um, I've been a chair of a number of committees. I've received two of their service awards. Uh, I started the, they have a national soccer championship that they host, which uh, I started it the first year. I was asked to be the 
um, the tournament director and um, hosted it the first year, served in that capacity for 10 years. And when I came here to Purdue, I uh, decided that it was time for to give that up and uh, allowed somebody else sure. to take over the lead. But um, yeah, that was, a, I think, a great achievement. The, the event is now a spectacular event for club soccer teams around the country. Um, you know, I've done a lot of hosting of uh, different things like runs, triathlons, some of them national caliber types of events um, over the years. But again, when I came to Purdue, I knew that my focus had to be on sure. the task ahead. So I started removing myself from some of those things so that I could focus on what I was doing here. But uh, I've done a lot of things uh, over the years. I, I was the facility chairperson for the United States Volleyball Association in the, in the 80s. And I traveled around the country putting on national uh, volleyball championships. Uh, so I've, I've kind you of got, a wide range of different I things. I would think so, right, exactly. Uh, do you have a, a Purdue tradition? A you know, I thought about that, yeah. and you know, I think the thing for me, and it comes from my background being at commuter camps, is the thing I think is neat here is how many people you see in Purdue colors. Now that sounds like a simple thing, but I can tell you coming from uh, Wichita State and Arizona State, these are campuses where you see almost as many people wearing the colors of other schools. That's and, interesting. And coming here and seeing you know, how people wear Purdue stuff, for me, is the neat thing. That's There's an interesting a, point, having not gone to other campuses, but pick up, and that's true, though. I mean, I have a lot a lot of Purdue members. I, I, I own more Purdue stuff than I, I own. We'll open our else. store one of these days. Yeah, Some it, of them, you don't, they don't make anymore. No, right? exactly. And, <laughs> and so for me, it's that's just a neat thing, is nice. seeing how proudly students wear that. You go into the rec center, and there's Purdue stuff everywhere. And so that, to me, is the thing that I, I like. That's very good. How about an outstanding event in your life? Um, you know, I, you know, I mean, outside of my marriage and my, sure. my family stuff, our That's kids, where many people have come. Um, you know, I, I think the chance to do this project, this has been, you know, it started, I mean, it's been an eight-year thing. I mean, I got here and within six months started doing the study and there have been progressions along the way. So this has consumed a lot of what I've done over the years. And so as a, it, it's a big thing, but I think it's something that will um, have significance for years to come. Right, and in CORAC in the 21st century, how do you see the CORAC uh, over the next five years? You know, I, I think we still need to find our way with, from a programmatic standpoint. Okay. How can we get more people involved? How do we, um, you know, change with the times as far as the recreational needs? But you know, one of the things we've talked about is our facility and what we do needs to be a vital part of what happens at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And so, finding ways to support the university in every way possible, whether it's with activities and events. Uh, you know, as an example, we currently are hosting the new employee orientations every Monday. Um, it's Good. something that, that brings new employees to our facility. It gives us a chance to, to hopefully get them involved in the physical activities that are going on in our space. But, you know, finding out how can we support other things at the university and then also making sure we're um, doing things to support um, student success, satisfaction, sure. and the learning that's going on. And, and we think we do that, but being able to demonstrate that in very tangible yeah. ways is what we'll be really working to do over the next Nicely few years. Nicely said. Is there any, anything in closing or something I forgot to ask that you'd like to add? You know, I think we've I have a, a There's a quote here. Uh -huh. The atrium embodies the idea of a campus center, a place to meet and enjoy and learn. That's a good quote. I think that's a great that's quote. That's very good. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, it's, we just can't even express, my staff and I talk about all the time, the positive comments we've gotten. I, I had a gentleman last week stop me, ask me a question, and then he shook my hand and he said, thank you for doing this. I, and this, uh, 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 he wasn't a student, I think he was yeah. a faculty staff, but we've had so many people uh, who have said this has uh, 
revitalize their involvement in physical activity, and you know it um, it kind of embodies our um, motto that we have, which is move more, achieve more. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that movement and exercise so ties us into to our ability to achieve and learn, and so kind of coupling that movement and activity with learning is what we're going to be trying to do. Very, very good. Howard, I want to thank you very much. This has been very enjoyable, and I know our researchers will appreciate it, and I thank you for it's your time. My pleasure. <laughs> oh.